Good morning. Thank you for the good mornings. <laughs> we live in a nation with uneven health care and health outcomes. Women are less likely to receive evidence-based treatment for cardiac disease, and they have poor functional outcomes after stroke. As you heard this morning from Dr. Riley and Dr. Shaw, we lead industrialized nations in terms of maternal mortality, and we are statistical outliers when it comes to severe maternal morbidity. The life expectancy for black Americans is about three and a half years shorter than for white Americans, largely due to cardiovascular mortality. These are complex problems, of course, but I'm interested in one very glaringly obvious opportunity for improvement, and that is in the discordance between the population receiving health care and the population giving and leading health care. In the United States, if you've seen a doctor, you have seen a white male doctor at some point. In the hospital, our teams are still largely led by white men, and the vast majority of CEOs and boards of directors are white men. We struggle to recruit racial and ethnic minorities to healthcare. So the people giving care in America don't look very much like America. And why does that matter? This is a recent study published in the economics literature in which they recruited young black men from barber shops in Oakland, and they brought them to a primary care clinic and randomized them to either a black physician or a white physician. If you were a black male in the study and you were randomized to a black physician, you were much more likely to receive health preventive measures, things like blood pressure and cholesterol and BMI and diabetes screening, and you were much more likely to receive the flu shot. The researchers in this study estimated that if you applied it across the population, racial concordance between physicians and patients could narrow the black-white gap in cardiovascular mortality by 19%. We're also seeing an increasing literature that shows the value that is brought to healthcare when you have women physicians at the lead of teams. In this study, if you were a hospitalized patient and you happened to receive a female rather than a male physician, you had lower odds of death while you were in the hospital. Lower odds of death. This isn't, did you like your doctor? Were you satisfied with your care? Did you feel listened to? This is actually about survival. And we're seeing the same thing for patients who come in and have surgery. In this study, they looked at female heart attack patients who come into emergency room and happen to receive care from a female rather than a male physician. Those patients had increased odds of survival. And then they did something interesting. They looked at the gender composition of each emergency department, and they found that when female heart attack patients come in and they receive treatment in an ED that has more female physicians, they are more likely to survive even if they're cared for by a male physician on that day. In other words, men physicians perform better when they have women in their group. And this is consistent with what we know about diversity's effect on collective intelligence and work performance. So it seems reasonable to say that a heterogeneous physician population is a better fit with our very heterogeneous patient population. Is that fair? So let's just diversify the workforce, right? But it's not that easy. And I'll tell you, part of the problem is that this workforce is not a very nice place to work for women and for racial and ethnic minorities. And I'll give you, to start with, just one example. This is a report that came out last year from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, in which they took a detailed look at sexual harassment across scientific fields. This report found that sexual harassment was very common. It is not improving over time. It is worse for racial and ethnic minorities than for other women, and it is worst in medicine compared to other scientific fields. 50% of female medical students experience sexual harassment before they've graduated from school, before they've even started their careers. The report also found that sexual harassment is the number one most important factor in determining women's workplace well-being. It has profound uh, impact on their longevity, longevity in their jobs, in productivity, in workplace engagement, and even on mental and physical health outcomes.
One of the authors of the study, Dr. Timothy Johnson, said if he had to design a system de novo that would allow sexual harassment to thrive, he would design a hospital that has all the critical elements for sexual harassment. It is male-dominated, it is male-led, there are steep vertical hierarchies, there are many different potential sources for harassment, and plenty of dark and quiet corners where behaviors uh, are not held to much accountability. Of course, gender harassment occurs in a setting where women have little power in general. And one indicator of this is the very persistent gender pay gap in healthcare. The estimates of the pay gap vary, but nationally, across specialties, women make about 75 cents to every dollar that male physicians make. This is not accounted for by any of the things you might think it's accounted for. So if you correct for choice of specialty and part-time work and even clinical and academic productivity, the pay gap remains. It is not absent in specialties that are dominated by women, like obstetrics and gynecology. It is not absent in nursing and it appears to be getting worse. Money isn't everything, of course. There's also opportunity and promotion and representation in highest leadership. My friend Eleni Linos led a team that looked at the top NIH-funded medical schools in the country, and they examined the proportion of female chairs compared to the proportion of male chairs with mustaches only. <laughs> Who do you think was more likely to be a chair, a woman or a man with a mustache? The mustache is one, 19% to 13%. And so we have this situation in which we're constantly talking about the leaky pipeline in healthcare, uh, uh, where women and racial and ethnic minorities tend to fall out and fall behind as we go forward. And you know, when I was in medical school, what I was told was, as a woman, I was likely to step back from the workforce because of my life choices. But now I think, well, there's a safety gap, and a dignity gap, and a pay gap, and an opportunity gap. When you have these caps, what is the choice here? Is there really a choice? We cannot pursue diversification of the workforce until we address these gaps. So overall, here's where we are. We're pretty convinced that diversity has a positive impact on the health goals that we care most about, which is providing outstanding care to all Americans. But we have major challenges before we can get anywhere close to realizing th that goal. As a woman of color in medicine, but also as a patient and as a mother and as a researcher and as an advocate for health equity, it seems very clear to me that time is up for healthcare. We have to make fundamental changes in our healthcare environment if we want to move forward. Thank you.